sponsored by CuriosityStream, now with my streaming service, Nebula. Three months ago, alongside the 2020 iPad Pro and cursor support for iPadOS, Apple announced the Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro. Two months ago, Apple began shipping it, and early reviews were mostly positive. For that second type of person, this setup, this accessory, is the best possible version of the iPad. This is a go, this is awesome. You can still use an iPad without this, but it has enhanced the entire experience overall. It's kind of a one trick pony, but I have to admit, it's a pretty good trick. The magic keyboard for iPad is the keyboard people like me have been waiting for. Find yourself some time to go get this magic keyboard. It's the real deal. Mostly. But you start to miss certain keys that you have on laptops, like the escape key, the volume controls, the brightness controls. I guess you guys have probably already noticed how dirty and smeary the bottom of this is. You, ju you just get a really nice keyboard case for $350. For me, well, I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is a magic keyboard for the 12.9 inch iPad Pro, two months later. There was no March Apple event this year. Instead, Apple launched the new iPad Pro and Magic Keyboard online. Maybe that's why there was some confusion about what exactly the Magic Keyboard is and what it's meant to be. How much does it weigh? Can you fold it back? Does it even have an easel mode? For me, Apple's press video answered all of those questions on day one, when Senior Vice President of Software Engineering, Craig Federighi, just walked over, slapped his iPad Pro down on the Magic Keyboard, and got to work. He wasn't already carrying it under his arm. He didn't unfold it using some awesome smack transformation like in the 2018 video. He's carrying the iPad around like an iPad, like a tablet, then walks over to a table and docks it so that he can use it like a laptop. So yes, you can absolutely fold it up to make it easier to transport with your iPad Pro. But no, you can't fold it back or put it into an easel mode because in that moment, Craig shows that it's not really meant to be a triple changer like the original origami smart keyboard or even an always on convertible like the current smart keyboard. When you dock the iPad Pro onto the Magic Keyboard, it's not fully conveniently usable as a tablet anymore because that's exactly what the Magic Keyboard really is, a dock. It sits on the table, plugged into pass-through power if you need it, ready to turn your iPad into something much closer akin to a laptop when you need it. Heavy, substantial, all keyboard and cursor. When you don't, you just peel the iPad Pro back off and go back to using it the way nature and Steve Jobs intended, as an iPad, a light, thin, touch-first iPad. And if you need to travel, you just bundle them up. The Magic Keyboard protects your iPad Pro, off you go. The Magic Keyboard lets the iPad stay true to itself. It lets the iPad be the iPad and doesn't strip that away from anyone who actually wants an iPad. It just lets people who need traditional computer input methods use them whenever they need them. Kinda. See, unlike a MacBook where all the computer guts are beneath the keyboard and the display is just this super light, blade thin screen hinged up on top of it, the iPad Pro has all of its computer guts behind the screen and the Magic Keyboard is just this blade thin typing surface weighed down so it's not so ultralight the iPad just topples over at every angle. Only some angles. Unlike the Smart Keyboard, which offers only two positions for the iPad when open, the Magic Keyboard hinge lets you adjust it any way you like along its usable range. That range just doesn't extend too far backwards or the iPad would take it over its center of gravity and the whole thing would just fall backwards. And that also constrains how you can use it. On a flat table, the entire usable range is perfectly usable. If you put it on your lap though, you have to keep your thighs super level or you have to use your palms to hold it down if you really want to for maximum. No, I'm not saying it. Writer Renee can script it, but he can't make host Renee say it. Lappable, that's a new word, right? Damn it, editor Renee always wins, fine. Whatever. Because a traditional laptop center of gravity is so low, you don't even have to think about any of that. But with the Magic Keyboard, you do. You also can't dock the iPad in portrait orientation, which was the only way you could dock the original iPad on the original iPad keyboard dock back in 2010. Most of the time, that doesn't bother me at all. Though I know some people really wanna use it that way. The only time it does really bother me is when I FaceTime or Zoom or use the front facing camera like at all because when placed on the Magic Keyboard, it's not really front-facing anymore. It's front 
offset. It's front adjacent. And that makes it just so hella awkward. Even though Apple's filled the landscape top with a magnetic inductive charging coils for the pencil, given every modern keyboard case and now dock prioritizes landscape mode, it would just make far more sense to position the same for that mode. You know, like every single MacBook ever. As someone who draws with the Apple Pencil a ton, it would be great if there was an easel mode as well. You can flip the Magic Keyboard upside down to try to simulate one, but it's super goofy. And honestly, I don't see how the geometry would work out for a proper one anyway. Sometimes it's just better to have a great keyboard dock than a middling multi-mode dock. Also, recognizing the limitations of the hinge doesn't mean I don't otherwise love this hinge, because I do. Within its operating angles, it works really, really well, although it's far easier to tilt down than tilt up. Again, just because of the weight distribution. It's the floating, cantilevered aspect of the design that really works for me though. It lets the iPad display just hang right over the number keys, which is much closer than a traditional laptop screen would be. And not only does that look cool, it keeps the touch screen just like right there, immediately available for whenever you need to touch it. It also keeps the footprint super minimal, which doesn't matter so much here at home even in an office, but I imagine will come in handy at coffee shops and especially on tray tables and airplanes. Not that I've been able to test any of that recently at all. The polyurethane material of the case looks great, but picks up a lot of smudges and fingerprints. So far, I've been able to wipe them off with exactly zero problems, which I guess is better than a material that smudges less, but cleans worse. I'd love to see a material or even a finish that keeps its looks better, like the bead blasted aluminum on the MacBooks, though obviously not bead blasted aluminum. The keyboard part of the Magic Keyboard looks like a Magic Keyboard. Also kinda. It's glossy black on matte black instead of glossy black on silver or space gray aluminum like on the most recent MacBooks, which I really like. My kingdom, such as it is for a jet black MacBook or iPad Pro, frankly. And the Magic Keyboard has inverted T arrow keys like all good natured keyboards should but there's no function or media or touch bar row above the numbers like there are on those MacBooks, which means no escape key, physical or virtual. Now I say that as someone who barely ever uses an escape key, but still has immense empathy for everyone that does, including those who need to use it routinely for development or are just used to using it to get out of whatever it is they're doing at the moment. You can remap escape functionality to the caps lock or emoji key, because of course there's an emoji key, but it feels needlessly janky. I'm sure some miss the function keys and many miss the media keys as well. I'd be just fine with a simpler version of tab C for control center, which you currently have to turn on in settings, accessibility, keyboards, full keyboard access. Just let me three finger swipe down to quickly get my controls and put everything I may need right there. Playback, brightness, everything. It wouldn't be as fast as an individual media key for all the major things, but it'd be so much more flexible and encompassing for all the things. Speaking of brightness, the backlighting is good crisp, clean, and mostly uniform except around the edges of the longer labels. Getting the backlight means giving up the water resistance of the smart keyboard keys because all design is compromised. But I type enough at night and spill drinks nowhere nearly enough that it's a great trade-off, at least for me. I know some people have complained about the backlight staying on too long and causing excessive battery drain. The Magic Keyboard is powered by the iPad, so it will drain faster when you have it attached, and the backlight will stay lit for a minute or so even after you stop typing, unless you put the iPad to sleep. And yeah, capabilities have a cost, and with mobile devices that cost is almost always paid in battery life. But for me, it's worth it, because as a keyboard, it's just flat out terrific. The feel is just like the Magic Keyboard on the MacBooks, only different. It's hard to explain. The keys seem the same, but more like they're mounted on something than in something, which keeps making me think they're taller and even pluckier. Technically, it has the same new scissor switches as the Magic Keyboards, just introduced on the Macs, with a steady, stable keycap and a millimeter of travel, and this nice, punchy feeling. I can and have typed on this keyboard for hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks now, and it's legit the only thing that's made me sad about not traveling these last couple of months because I'd be using it even more on the road, at coffee shops, at airports, in hotels than I am at home. The big revelation of the Magic Keyboard isn't actually the keyboard at all. It's the trackpad. There is this incredibly rich history of features starting out with the accessibility team at Apple and then being picked up on by the UI kit or springboard team and becoming just ubiquitous parts of the system. And that's exactly what happened with the minimal cursor support from iOS 12 becoming the maximal cursor support now in iOS 13. Because, say it with me, 
accessibility is for everyone. I know some will praise Apple for not just porting over the pointer model from macOS, but making something closer akin to an adaptive touch model, where the little cursor circle transforms into a button shape or text insertion bar in this gorgeously liquid and fluid way. And yeah, sure, others will grouch that Apple had to do this because they stripped all the button shape, all the affordances out of iOS 7 and still haven't replaced them with anything nearly as usable or considerate. Again, por que no la dos? Both those things can be true. And this trackpad handles the system as is really, really well. But also as hopefully it gets better, will also get better with it. It's nowhere nearly as big as a modern MacBook trackpad. Those could easily sleep four of these. The Mac trackpad are absurdly large because they don't have multi-touch screens. So the trackpad is the only gesture area you get. The iPad Pro, even when docked, is still all touchscreen. So I'm fine with the trackpad being smaller. That said, it is a little cramped for gestures like pinch to zoom and actions like drag and drop, but not that it stopped me from getting anything done. It's also a real physical trackpad and not a virtual taptic trackpad like on the Mac, unmoving glass and metal when it's off, total proprioceptive mind frack when it's on. But it feels like the Mac trackpad in that you can click on it from any point, any corner, top or bottom, left or right, and they all click equally satisfyingly great. Not at all like the common hinge track pads that click great right on the bottom, but not so much at all near the top. The thing is for me though, because the gestures on the iPad Magic Keyboard trackpad are so similar to the ones on the Mac trackpad, it just feels completely natural and intuitive to use. And I don't have to even really think about it at all. And that's exactly the problem this trackpad had to solve, the job it had to get done. Save me from having to take my hands off the keyboard to touch the screen to do most navigational tasks. Save me from having to change context, lose my flow and deal with my dumb, poorly transitional human brain and just let me keep my hands on the keyboard and keep working. And even as a version 1.0, that's exactly what it does. There's a USB-C port on the left side of the Magic Keyboard hinge that can be used to plug the keyboard into power and pass that power right on through to the iPad Pro. I'm guessing Apple put it there because the Magic Keyboard draws its power from the iPad Pro and enough power that it takes it below the 10 hour iPad battery life that Apple has held inviolable since the original. So adding a USB-C power pass through to the hinge is just the sacrifice Apple had to make to the power gods in order to let this keyboard ship. And you know what? I'm fine with that. In fact, I prefer to have USB-C power pass-throughs on both sides so I can plug in from either side, especially considering how grotesquely short the USB-C cables are that Apple ships with almost everything these days. Now, I don't know if the smart connector, which is the power, data, and ground relay between the Magic Keyboard and the iPad Pro, has the bandwidth and speed to actually support accessories as well as power, or if handling a keyboard is pretty much where it taps out, but it would be great if we could plug in accessories as well, especially if there were dual ports and one could be for power and the other for a microphone or external storage or anything at all that just doesn't have to travel around without the keyboard. That would make the Magic Keyboard dock a far more useful dock and the iPad Pro truly, truly pro. Even if, yeah, it would also make an already very expensive keyboard dock one extra data port and better connector more expensive. Speaking of which, the Magic Keyboard starts at 229 US for the 11 inch and a whopping 349 for the 12.9 inch model. And that's a lot. That's a 10.2 inch iPad a lot. You can still get the smart keyboard absent trackpad for less, but if you want everything Apple currently has to offer, it's gonna cost you. Add it to the price of an iPad Pro and it's gonna kick you well up into the MacBook levels, maybe even MacBook Pro levels. And again, a lot, but you also gain a lot in terms of capabilities. So end of the day, you have to decide if it's worth it to you or not, if that cost is exceeded by the value. For some pros, it'll be a no brainer. It'll get charged straight to a client or the company and paid off in a single gig or two. But if it's just you, if it's just you and your wallet, like it's just me and mine these days, the question becomes, are you enough of a traditional computer user, a laptop user, that being able to dock your iPad Pro and make it more of a laptop would be a big enough productivity boost that it's worth your hard-earned money. If you're using your iPad Pro primarily as a multi-touch tablet or with the Apple Pencil, the answer might well be no. 
But if you're typing a ton and doing a lot of productivity work, I suspect the answer will be yeah. Oh, well, hell yeah. Because that's the exact feeling you get when you combine these two great things together. Just like when you combine Curiosity Stream and Nebula. <laughs> and even way much better price. Nebula is the amazingly cool new streaming video service I'm building with a group of like-minded education -y creator friends. People like Legal Eagle, Thomas Frank, Jordan Harrod, Real Science, and more. It's a place where we can try out new things without having to worry about the dreaded algorithm or being demonetized or just being told to stay in our YouTube lane. I just did my first Nebula original, a part of the working title series, and it's all about one of my favorite TV shows, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's just something I could never post here on this channel because YouTube would just have no idea what to do with it. But it's also a place where we can post all of our regular videos, videos just like this, without any ads or sponsorships at all. In fact, new ad-free, sponsor-free content from amazing creators goes up not just every week, but every day, multiple times a day, which is great if you're tired of waiting for other services to update. There are even special and extended versions of our videos, like I've been posting the full-length versions of my interviews on Nebula as well, 45-minute chats with iJustine, Brian Tong, Walt Mossberg, and more to come. Where, after the tech talk, Justine and I dive into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Brian and I geek out over superheroes. And next up, John Gruber and I talk all about James Bond. Again, things that would just get buried here by the algorithm. And now, because Nebula comes bundled with CuriosityStream, you also get access to its thousands of documentaries and series by people like David Attenborough and Chris Hatfield, all for just $19.99 a year. A year. Seriously, it's the best deal in streaming today. Just go to curiositystream.com slash Rene Ritchie for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And now, Nebula as well. And enter the promo code Rene Ritchie to start your membership completely free for the first 31 days. Thanks, CuriosityStream, and thanks to all of you for your support.